Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast, where we focus on how authors found success, looking at strategies that have taken them to the top of the bestseller charts, as well as what they've learned from their mistakes. Because being an indie author is more than knowing the latest marketing trend. It's about being innovative and creative and learning from your mistakes. Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. I'm Sarah Rosette. And I'm Jamie Albright. And this week on the show, we have Mark McGinnis. Yes, we do. And it was a great podcast and not one that I thought (laughs) I was going to enjoy. And I really, really enjoyed it. And I say that because I was wrong. And (laughs) I'm sorry, but Campbell is in the background playing with a truck or something. So I'm sorry if y'all have It's okay. I can't that. hardly even hear it. So okay. it'll be fine. Anyway, yeah. but yeah, it was a great interview. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. And I would say that if you think, oh, poetry is not for me. I'm not into poetry. I'll skip this one. I wouldn't. I would go ahead and give it a listen because we talk about not only poetry, but writing, um, well, just like general writing best practices, kind of like yes. how to yes. get your story down or your poem down. Um, the creative process. We talk about that and um, some you know, Mark had a mistake that he um, ended up going in a totally different career path. So it was very interesting, yeah. just um, interesting stuff, interesting stuff. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed it. I mean, it was kind of inspirational for me. I learned things about poetry that I didn't really know before. And um, yeah, I, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed this interview. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, and he also tells us about his podcast it's specifically for poetry called yes. The Mouthful of Air. And so Which if I you're interested in poetry yeah. and, you know, that, you know, is a way that he is bringing his poetry to people in a new way. And we mm-hmm. talk about, mm-hmm. you know, several different kind of new um, ways that poets are bringing their uh, poetry to people and finding a new right. audience. Right, so. right. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, so. Again, don't skip it. You should listen to it because really you're going to get something out of it, I promise. So what's been going on with you, Sarah? Well, this week I can finally see the end of my book in sight. Yay! Draft one. And so for me, that's just such a relief when I can get there and I can, I still have a lot to do, a lot of words to get down on paper, but it's like I can see where I'm going now. And and then once I I can go a little bit faster, um, talk to Becca signed the other day and um, we were talking about intellection and, Mm -hmm. and certainty and how, if you have high intellection, you want certainty. And I thought, I think that's why I can go faster at the end because Mm -hmm. I know where I'm going now. And I, you know, there's only one path left and it's Mm -hmm. easier for me to go quicker. So, right. So yay doing that. And um, that is about all the exciting writing news I have, I know, I know. (laughs) but I did want to mention that did you see the news that draft to digital has acquired Smashwords? Yes. Yes. That yes. must've been what Kevin was alluding to when he was on our podcast. Yes. Before. He gave some big hints, but he did not spill the beans to us. So, mm-mm, mm-mm. so yeah, so that'll be, I think really good. Yeah. It'll, it'll be nice because there, I know that there were certain places that you could get to with draft digital and certain places that you could get to with Smashwords, and some of them crossed over, but I don't think they all did. So right. it'll be really nice to have mm-hmm. everything in one place for that. Right. So, right. Right. Yeah. Be good. So what about you? Uh, what you well, just working on this book and um, that's really it. I mean, nothing else major except, um, you know, since I took my break from TikTok mm-hmm. uh, and have come back, I don't know what happened. I have no idea, but it's like all of a sudden I've found romantic comedy readers and nice. um you know I don't I haven't had anything go viral I mean I have a couple of videos since I came back that are around 15 16,000 but that's mm-hmm. not viral and uh but all of my other videos have gone as far as views have gone up but more than that just the comments and the, I saw your video and I re- got your mm-hmm. book or I've read all your books since I saw your video last week and mm-hmm. and you know, I wasn't getting any of that before my break. So I, I honest to God, <laughs> so, so moral could, of the story yeah, is take a break I, for I what a month. <laughs> wish I could tell people what to do, but I, I can't. And, and it's not like, again, I'm not doing what a lot of people are doing, you know, just knocking mm-hmm. it out of the park every time, but, but it has been 
just different. You're seeing so, some interaction. Yeah, so I that's am. good. I'm seeing yeah. interaction. I'm seeing increase in sales. I'm seeing, I'm kind of seeing everything. Nice. Um, and then just fun news. Uh, Chris and I went last night and met Claire Taylor and her husband. And we saw Nate Bargatsky uh, mm-hmm. at the, in Austin at the Bass Concert Hall. And I have not laughed that hard <laughs> in I don't know when. And I've talked about his comedy special on here before the Tennessee kid uh-huh. if you have not watched it you need to watch it it is not offensive it is it is just funny and um or my kind of funny and yeah. anyway it's just a you know it feels good to laugh I mean mm-hmm. especially after all we've been through mm-hmm. and stuff, I just and to sit in a, a room with people and laugh that was just that's like Jamie's happy place. Yeah, right? it <laughs> really was. I I mean, at one point I was like, I am having trouble breathing. Like I can't catch my breath. Yeah. It is so funny. So anyway, yeah. but yeah, that was great. And well, that's um, good. Yeah. Well, so, two thumbs up for that then. Right. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Really fun. Yeah. And that really is it. That's all the yeah. news I have. Okay. Well, I'm, I have on my list to go see murder on the or, or mm, death yes. on the Nile <laughs> wrong movie. Yeah. And I haven't done that yet. I'm mm-hmm. kind of don't know if I'm going to like it, but yeah. I will definitely go see it because, mm-hmm. you know, golden yeah. age right. adaptation. Then, I must. <laughs> yes. And then also uh, marry me by with oh. uh, Jennifer Lopez and um, oh gosh, his name just left me. Hmm. Owen Wilson. And yeah, I go. haven't seen it yet, but you know, it's a rom-com and I can't, you know, well, a, you got to go see that too. A yeah. marriage, a fake marriage, marriage of convenience kind of thing. And I can't wait. So yeah, okay. I'll let you right. know when well, I that's it. our Valentine's week yeah. <laughs> entertainment sorted. I'll go see a murder mystery. Yeah. See a I'll go see a rom-com. Yeah. <laughs> we'll report back. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, we should get on with Mark's yes, interview because it's really, should. really good. It is. All right. All right. So here's Mark. All right. Well, today we are super excited to have Mark McGinnis with us. Hi, Mark. How are you? Hi, I'm doing great. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, we're glad you're here. So we are going to talk about poetry today. But first, yes. let me read your bio and then we'll get started. Mark McGinnis is an award-winning poet based in Bristol, UK. On his podcast, A Mouthful of Air, he explores the writing process of outstanding poets, first by reading and discussing classic poems, and also by inviting contemporary poets to read a single poem and talk about the process of writing it. That is great. So tell us how you got into writing poetry. Well, I think like a lot of your guests, it all started with a lot of reading. So I was, mm-hmm. I was the kid who was always reading. Um, but specifically poetry was when I was a teenager and I had a couple of amazing English teachers, Sue Dove and then Jeff Riley. And one of the things they did was we would spend an entire class looking at one or two poems in, mm-hmm. d- in detail. Mm-hmm. And it just blew my mind that you could spend an hour looking at this little block of text. And at the end of the hour, there would still be more stuff you were finding. Because really? the more you look, the more you, you find. The, the magic of the poem, it just opens up. Mm. And I just, I just, I was absolutely entranced by this. So I went away and I read and I started scribbling and writing. And, and I remember one afternoon in particular, Jeff gave us the assignment of writing a ballad based on a novel that we were reading in class. And I we all got started in class. He said, well, you know, bring it next week when, when mm-hmm. you're done. And I found myself in, in what we called a jotter, which I don't know if it's an American t- term. It was like, you know, the, the rough notebook. It wasn't yes. any stuff. But I was writing in my rough notebook. And I found myself in the back of my chemistry class, my history class, my maths class. You know, normally I was the boringly good student who always paid attention and did what he was told. Mm-hmm. But I found myself you know, going heading for the back of the class so I could get the jotter out and keep scribbling away at this <laughs> poem because it wouldn't let me go. There was a little kind of mischievous little goblin that had got into me. <laughs> and I kept going and kept going. And it it, it just, I guess that was the day I, I, I've got a clear memory of thinking, well, maybe I could do this. You know, this magical thing with the words that they keep kind of dancing around and revealing more the more you look at them or play mm-hmm. with them maybe I could write it as well as read it so that's really how I got started well that is interesting and I think poetry is so interesting because it's 
it, it's like when you, when I read poetry versus when I read prose, it's like, I have to kind of disengage my mind from, it's like, you have to approach it a different way. And I th- mm-hmm. think it's the same way. Is it the same way when you write it? Like when you're writing it, do you approach it from a different way than you would your prose? Yeah, I do. <laughs> Much more slowly. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, these days, the way I start writing prose is I usually, I will use otter.ai, you know, the speech recognition, and I'll, I'll get mm-hmm. an idea and I will just talk into the phone. And it's great because I can splurge out a, a first draft very quickly and then I start editing that. Mm-hmm. And it's much more obvious, much more left brain, if you like, much more logical. You know, this mm-hmm. is what I need to say and this mm-hmm. is what, what's on my mind. But with poetry, it's nearly always it's either handwriting or it's writing in my head. So I will get an idea and I'll play around with it in my head. You know, I tried using speech recognition and there was no point because I couldn't think of anything fast yes. enough. Yes. So usually what happens with poetry is I will get a line or two will pop into my mind and I think, oh, that could be something. Mm-hmm. And it was, you know, the French p- p- poet, Paul Valerie talked about they were donné and they were calculated the, the given line, the one that comes to you, and then the calculated, the, you know, the worked on line. Mm. And unfortunately, the ratio one to the other is quite high. <laughs> you, <laughs> you, get, you get one or two lines and you've got to really work hard at it. Mm-hmm. And the way I think about it is it's a bit like archaeology. You know, if you're, well, I haven't done archaeology, but when I've seen them on TV, mm-hmm. you know, they, they, they'll, um, They'll be digging and then they get a, a tile or a piece of ceramic and then they go and then they say, well, what do you think this is? And they say, well, it could be a Roman villa mm. or maybe it could be an Anglo-Saxon bathhouse mm. or it could be a church. And based on their guess, then they extrapolate where they need to dig to find the rest of the building. Mm-hmm. And it feels a bit like that. If I get one line, I will look at it and think, well, how does that line work? What's the rhythm? What's the shape? Does it feel like it wants to rhyme with something? Mm-hmm. Does it, has it got a strong rhythm? Is it more of a free verse thing? And that will help me figure out what the rest of the poem needs to be like. And then I'll start making some educated guesses and dig over here and dig over there. And that, it's and it's quite a, a slow process as well, yeah. like archaeology. That, well, That's fascinating. That yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, I mean, because it just takes me a while to get the words down. So I understand that. So, well, what do you wish you had known about the, about writing poetry now? Like looking back, what do you wish you would know? I wish I had known that the craft is a key to the magic. Mm. Because we tend to think of them as being opposite, don't we? There's inspiration on one hand, mm-hmm. all the sparkly, exciting stuff. Then the craft is all the thing. You have to read the long books and practice <laughs> stuff and go to yeah. classes. And for me, at least, it turned out to be the other way around. So I spent a long time when I was younger. <clears throat> excuse me. I spent a long time when I was younger trying to figure out, you know, what have I got to say? What's my subject? What's, what's the topic? And... Similarly, whenever I go to a writing class and I get given a prompt based on some topic or an idea, it's really hard for me to get any poetry out of that. But if you were to say to me, hey, Mark, there's this obscure 16th century verse form. Here are the, <laughs> here's how it works. Can you write something that fits that? I can always come up with something. And huh. I'll kind of reverse engineer it because I go, yeah. well, if that's the form, what does that form remind me of? And And so I kind of, go back from there and even beyond getting the initial idea I find the more I learn about poetry and how it works and and, and particularly the more poetry I read and really read and and go back and look at well how is this working the more the magic unfolds to me and to me that and I, I think the conclusion I've come to is that well actually the craft is is the poem. You know, that's why it's a poem and it's not an essay or a novel or a nonfiction book or whatever. So it kind of makes sense that the magic would be in there, but it was, mm-hmm. it was pretty well hidden from me for quite a long time. Mm. Uh, I really wish I could go back to my 20-something self and just said, look, just stop trying to figure out what you've got to say. Just start playing around with the words a bit more. Right, right. Well, that's that's amazing because I I guess I I mean I certainly didn't think that either. I I guess I think 
because I know very little about poetry yet. We talked about this before we got on, that it's just the inspiration comes and you kind of get the bulk of it through the inspiration. And then you kind of opposite of what you were saying earlier that, you know, you get the inspiration and then the rest of it is what you build into it and craft around it. Um, and that, that's the romantic story of poetry, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's yeah. It's kind of the story that poets would like the rest of us <laughs> <laughs> to think. And it's not to say it doesn't ever come. And and I, I do love the romantics and Coleridge's mm. um, and Wordsworth, particularly two of my favourite poets. They did a lot of writing of poetry out walking on the hills or the mm. roads. Coleridge famously claimed that Kubla Khan, one of his greatest poems, came to him in a in an opium reverie and up in a farmhouse uh, <laughs> one day. But even then, you know, the, there is, I think it's pretty obvious that he worked on it a bit after that. Um, I think maybe that day, and also, I mean, it's opium, so I'm not quite sure I'm ready to go that far. Yeah, 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 for your art, but, yes. Uh, you know, I, I guess what you could say is maybe the, the balance of, of the given line and the the worked online was maybe shifted in his favor a bit that mm-hmm. day. Mm-hmm. But overall, you know, poets, they, I mean, if you look at manuscripts of um, great poems, usually there'll be quite a lot of them. There'll be several drafts, even, you know, the one page of Shakespeare's manuscript we've got, you can see there are bits crossed out wow. and that he's rewritten. You can see the words that were nearly Shakespeare, which mm-hmm. I find <laughs> fascinating. Mm-hmm. Um, and certainly one thing I've discovered interviewing, poets for my podcast is there's a lot of patience there's a lot of rewrite rewriting there's a lot of I think Mona Arshley put it quite well where she said just trying to get out of the way of the poem <laughs> mm-hmm. trying to get out of your own way and let the poem come through which she said is you know the hardest thing um, and I've said several times to poets you know when they've talked about how hard particularly the ending I think because there's generally a lot there's a lot. Um, there's a lot hanging on the ending. By the time mm-hmm. you get to the end of a poem, you know, we like to have a good last line. Um, and a lot of poets will say, yeah, "I worked really hard to get that last line." And I've said several times, well, "This isn't the normal romantic myth, is it?" <laughs> and they say, "No, sadly not." So yeah, yeah but, uh, but but there is that element of inspiration. I don't want to downplay it. Yes. But, and I do think very often the poems I've been most pleased with are the ones that have started something's come to me when I've been doing something else mm-hmm. and it's just a line has popped into my mind and, and there is a magic to that. So mm-hmm. I think what we're trying to do with the craft is, is kind of raise ourselves up to the level of that magic, if you like. Okay. Yeah. Love that. Love that. So what about marketing poetry? I mean, we talked about before we get on, got on, you know, uh, just briefly that it's hard to sell poetry sometimes. And mm-hmm. um, so what do you? What advice do you have? What do you wish you'd known about that? I think one thing I wish I'd known about marketing in general is that it's much better when you don't treat it as separate to the to the work you want to do. You know, the idea that oh, you yeah. you do yeah. the work yeah. and then you've got to sell it, and that's the, and we like yeah. the we like the writing or, or the making, whatever it is, and, mm. and we don't we don't want to do the the icky capitalist <laughs> selling part. Mm. Whereas. I think the more I just think of how can I share this work, how can I extend it into the world, right. that naturally, well, hey, I want to do it more. You know, mm-hmm. I want to do I want, you know, if you write something, it's certainly if I write something, I want someone to read it. I want yes. someone to hear it. Yes. I want to know that I've connected with a reader, even if there's no money exchanging hands. And so when I was thinking about poetry, because Again, there's there's a limiting story around poetry, which is nobody reads it. It's a minority interest. And, you know, we could we could indeed find quite a lot of evidence for that. Mm-hmm. But the way I like to look at it is, well, if you look at the big picture in the past, poetry used to be quite a lot more popular. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't necessarily printed and sold in books. You know, for a long time, people would listen to poems. They would mm-hmm. listen to the ballad singer around the campfire in mm-hmm. the evening. Um, you could, I mean, it's it's older even than writing. You know, the oldest poems are that, that well that are written down mm-hmm. are poems that look like they probably came from an oral tradition before that. So Homer, for instance, there's an yes. argument that it wasn't just one 
person sitting down and writing it all down in this you know burst of inspiration or in a long retreat. Mm-hmm. Um, but it had been going on for hundreds of years, maybe even longer than that, as the work of lots and lots of different poets who would take the basic story and embellish it and then and then hand it down from generation to generation. Mm-hmm. And my so the reason I call the poetry podcast a mouthful of air is to put that emphasis on the spoken form of the poem, the fact that it's it's an ephemeral thing, but it's something that can really land in your ear and resonate in your heart. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I even encourage listeners to read the poems out loud for themselves, e- e- even in the privacy of their own room. Because <laughs> when you, it's easy to look at a poem on the page and feel disconnected or feel, mm, I don't really understand that, I didn't study it, I haven't got the mm-hmm. footnotes, whatever. But when you read it out loud, the poem is inside you. Mm. It's resonating with you and you can't help but feel something of the emotion. And it's a really powerful experience. So for me, I want to get what I'm doing with the podcast is just think, what is the shortest route between speaking a poem and getting someone to to hear it? Mm -hmm. And podcasts seem to be like an obvious fit for that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, You know, mm -hmm. I'm sure you've discovered this, Mm -hmm. that it's a real privilege being a podcaster because our listeners listen to us in their in their me time in the mm-hmm. quiet time when they're mm-hmm. chilling out or they're commuting or they're exercising or they're tidying up the office or driving or whatever and i just thought would it wouldn't it be nice to be the voice in that person's ear speaking a poem mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and if i can get the actual poet if they're still alive i get them to come on the show and read the poems then then there's no distance between the poet and the listener. And I'm getting some lovely responses from people who say, I think one of my favourites was the podcaster, Carol Lock Colt. She wrote to me and she said, I used to run screaming from poetry. (laughs) But (laughs) now that I hear it and I hear the poets talking about what went into it and the process, it feels like it's opened a door and I can relate to it. And it's, and it's, it's not an academic subject. You know, I, I really want to emphasize that because it's been kind of turned into one. Yes, but yes. Poets never started out as academics. Mm-hmm. We're not. I discovered, I mean, I couldn't be an academic. I discovered I was allergic to it. So, <laughs> um, I, I was, Poetry was originally, yeah, that, like you were saying, it was originally entertainment. You know, the spoken yeah, word it, was, yeah, yeah, inter- it it was to entertain. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes, mm-hmm. it was. And if it didn't entertain, then... You know, someone would shout for another song, or you know, yes. the Lord would, yes. you know, throw a quart of ale at you and say, mm-hmm. "Sing something more cheerful, or <laughs> yes. more jolly." Or I want to hear the one about the dragon again. Yes, know? exactly, yes. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, so we've talked about this a little bit, but are there any specific um, assumptions that you made when you started writing poetry, or just writing in general? And um, looking back, did they turn out to be right or wrong? So what that reminds me of is the day, so when I was at college, we were lucky enough to have the children's author, Leon Garfield, come oh. to visit the Literary Society. And we were sat around the table listening. He, he was reading and answering questions. And the question I asked him was, a ripe old age of about 20, I said, <laughs> so what, if, what advice would you give to someone who's considering writing as a career? And without missing a beat, he said, do something else first. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> otherwise you're not going to have anything to write about. Write about, and yeah. Of, of course, that's not what I wanted to hear. I wanted to go straight to the, you know, being the, the yes. man of letters. Um, <laughs> but he was right. And I think maybe that was partly down to my struggle, with, particularly in my 20s, that I didn't really get going as, as fast as I'd like to with the poetry. It was really, I, that was a time for living and discovering and, and doing other things. And, you know, I, I feel that in quite a few ways, well, in, uh, sorry, let me say that again. <laughs> and I was a bit of a late starter, really, when it came to really getting into my stride as a poet, mm. um, even after having that great experience at school. And, I, you know, looking back, I think Leon Garfield was right that I had to mm. live a bit before I had something to, you know, worth To write about, about. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I love that answer. I think that 
is true of a lot. Of, I mean, not just poetry, but writing in general. I, I oh, just, absolutely. Yeah, you know, I and and Leon Garfield was, I, I don't know how well known he is in the States, but over here he's, he's one of the best known children's and young adult um, novelists. He's really mm-hmm. terrific. Well, that's great. Um, so have you ever made a mistake that turned out to be a good thing? Yes. A few months, in fact, after I spoke to Leon Garfield, um, I wasn't really he- heeding his wisdom. I <laughs> got myself so stressed that, so I was, um, I'd gone from being a state school um, pupil. I managed mm-hmm. to get myself into Oxford University through working uh, really hard and being wow, yeah. ambitious and driven and single-minded in the way mm-hmm. that we are when we're young and we have a dream. But I took that too far and I got too obsessed with, this is, this is why I said I'm allergic to academia. I got too obsessed with getting good grades and being able to stay in academia and, and, go, and stay on and do a PhD. Mm-hmm. And I got myself so stressed that my doctor signed me off with stress and uh-huh. I wasn't able to do my final exams and I had to go home in what it felt like I was going home in disgrace, but actually yeah. I was just going home for the good of my health. Yes. Um, and I ended up having to take a year out to do a lot of therapy, come back. I took the exams the following year and I passed them. But actually, by that point, I'd realized that academia wasn't really going to be it for me. And I didn't know what it would be. And it was actually after even after that second attempt at the exams, I was sat there agonizing to my therapist one day saying, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. Mm -hmm. And she looked at me and she said, you know, you could do this. Yes. And I thought, really? And I never thought about that because I, I'd found the therapeutic process really valuable. Mm-hmm. But the idea of me practicing, right. it hadn't occurred to me. And actually, I went away after, not straight away, but eventually I went away. I trained as a therapist and I spent nearly 20 years practicing psychotherapy. Mm-hmm. And that was, I think that was a big part of the, you know, Leon Garfield mm-hmm. experience, a bit of life before you can mm-hmm. write about mm-hmm. it. Um, so. That's my answer. It was a mistake getting so obsessed mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. with the wrong with the wrong approach to writing. You know, be, being a good academic, being saying writing clever criticism about poetry. Actually, I never wrote any poetry at Oxford, mm-hmm. um, and it was only afterwards that I, once I'd stepped away from that, and poetry became. It, I guess I'm just thinking about this now. It was more like that mischievous thing I was doing at the back of the class again, wasn't yes, it? <laughs> yes, yes, Because it wasn't the thing I was supposed to be doing. And, right. Um, you know, when it was my academic subject, I was supposed to be doing it, and then it, it felt like I should be doing this. Mm-hmm. And it a little more like work, maybe. It wasn't work, as mischievous. Yeah. It wasn't as fun, was it? Yeah, so yeah. I guess that, that, that came out of that. So, yeah, that was a mistake. Mm-hmm. And it did lead to lots of good things because, yeah. thank goodness, I didn't stay in academia. Yeah. <laughs> well, what a great background, too, uh, for writing as a uh, psychotherapy. I mean, surely that mm-hmm. has had a huge impact on your writing. Mm-hmm. I think indirectly. I mean, obviously, I would never write directly about a client. No, and right. I don't, I don't think I'd ever even be tempted to. But, but certainly what it did was I, I saw a lot of life yes. you know, through and heard about a lot of life mm-hmm. through you know, the, the stories and the, the people I work with. Mm-hmm. And it was, um, I mean, I learned so much from from people really up against, you know, you go and see a therapist when you're facing one of the most difficult challenges of your life. Mm-hmm. And to see people who, in, in a lot of instances, were dealing with situations that, thank goodness, I've never had to deal with anything as, as demanding as that. And really rising to the occasion, you know, you mm-hmm. see the best of, Mm-hmm. human beings um, often when they're when they're really challenged like that so mm-hmm. um a lot of time tragedy yeah 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 and then try yeah. again yeah that's, that's i mean not always sadly you can't yes you, you can't help everybody and there are some situations that you know there's a limit to what you can do but but certainly um going back to your question i i think yeah that certainly the human heart was no longer an academic subject after doing that. Oh, that's great. I love that. Yeah, I really love that. Because I do think of poetry, my limited knowledge of poetry is it is 
in a lot of ways, a reflection of the human heart and, and the mm. human existence, yeah. only, just told a different way. And um, I think that that's beautiful. I, I love that. I love that. So what is the biggest mindset shift do you um, that you've had during your career? So what comes to mind now is following on from what I was just saying about training as a therapist. I remember going into the college in Regent's Park on the first morning of my psychotherapy training. And this is me having come off what felt like a big failure Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in my um, academic career. And up on the whiteboard, Unbeknown to me, uh, this was written by John Eaton, who, would, who then became my supervisor and mentor and now a good friend. He had written the words, there is no failure, mm. only feedback. Oh, and that yeah. kind of stopped me in my tracks because it, it was as though a, a, a door opened and there was this possibility that what had felt like a failure maybe wasn't. Mm-hmm. And I... I find this so often that whenever I get stuck, um, which still happens in life as in writing, but there's always a part of me now that's going, okay, so what have you missed? What what do you need to step back and take account of? And even, you know, anytime something does look unequivocally like a failure, you just think, well, what's the upside of this? Right, right. So I think that attitude, which was really embedded in me as a a therapist, Mm -hmm. Um, really serves me well as a writer, you know, that yeah. any time that you really feel stuck, just think, actually, there is a, there's a lesson, there's a learning here for me. And if mm-hmm. it's the kind of pattern that keeps coming back, like David Bowie's song, he says, always crashing in the same car, then you think, okay, well, <laughs> why do I keep getting in this car? What, what am I doing here that's yes. creating this situation over and over again? Yeah. So, yeah. Yes. Yes. We've talked about fear of failure a lot, and it's something that I personally, I don't want to fail. I don't want to be wrong. But if you can look at it in in that way, that it's just a learning process and it's okay, it's a completely different way of looking at it. So, yes. Yeah, I think that we look at failure. We we do not appreciate the benefits of failure in our society and um, how that is an opportunity. We, We don't look at it as an opportunity to learn to do something different or do something better or just correct something that we've done over and over and over again, like you said. So. Yeah. And of course, in the moment, it's hard to say. Uh, that, so, it? <laughs> it's so hard. Yeah. Um, like, I've, I mean, I've dealt with it this whole year. This is, this has been my year to think, what can I learn from this? But it took me six months to get to the point of what can I learn? I wallowed for a long time about things just aren't going the way they used to go for a mm-hmm. while. And yeah. and it's hard not to to be critically self-reflective and and um, look at things from an opportunity standpoint as opposed to I have failed and it's never going to get better standpoint. So. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think the thing that I try and do is is just break that pattern, just step away from the mm-hmm. computer, step away from the notepad, come do something else. I did, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> is, you know, in Leon Garfield's <laughs> phrase, even if it's only for half an hour, but something, you know, it can be hard to do that. And I'm, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yes, very true. It is. Well, we've talked a little bit about your podcast, A Mouthful of Air. So um, tell us a little bit more about that. and. Um, you know, maybe some of your favorite guests or your yes. favorite poems that you've discussed, something yes. from your podcast. Okay, so the idea, as I said, came from wanting to share poems because I'm always the person in my immediate group of friends who's who's reading the book of poems. I'm, I'm the odd one out. <laughs> and my family and my immediate circle of friends, bless them, you know, they're, they're kind of curious up to a point but after a while they want to change the subject Mm -hmm. (laughs) and I but I I also I have this thought that poetry is different to the way a lot of people think about it it isn't that difficult it's not that intimidating it's actually a lot more entertaining Mm -hmm. than um 
you know, the, the, the popular image. So I thought, okay, let's make a show where I focus on one poem per episode. So all the episodes are quite short, around about half an hour or less. And what you hear, the first thing you hear is the poem, because you don't need an explanation. If it's a good poem, you don't need an introduction. You don't need an mm -hmm. explanation. You mm -hmm. don't need the footnotes. And it, it, if it doesn't do anything for you, then maybe it's not a great poem, or maybe it's not the poem for you. Mm -hmm. So I really want people to just be a little more confident and just notice, how do I feel when I hear this? What images right. pop into my mind? What thoughts does it create? What, what, um, what feeling do I get from it? And then you get, after you've heard the poem, then you get a little bit of context. So if it's a classic poem, in other words, if the poet's dead, then <laughs> I will read the poem myself. And I will enthuse about it. I will say, look, this is why I've picked the poem. This is why I love it. Mm -hmm. This notice what the poet has done on this line. Mm -hmm. Notice that they run this with this, and I think you know that that might be significant. And I want to show people the way the poem seems to me, because to me, you know, that is technicolor, that is exciting, yes. that is surround sound, three D cinema experience. And if it's a living poet, then I get them to come on the show, read the poem, and then I'll ask them a few questions. Mm -hmm. And I want, really, I'm, I'm interested in two basic questions, which is one, where did the poem come from? So that's where they tell us the source of inspiration. And then how did it find its current form? In other words, what was the process and what was mm -hmm. the decisions, the technical decisions and so on that you made in, in writing it? And I get all kinds of stories about <laughs> what happened, where people get poems from, and the things they did. I think probably the most extreme one was Shazia Qureshi, who she was writing a poem about taxidermy. So I naively said, well, how did you, because this is, seems a very detailed and realistic description <laughs> of doing taxidermy on a mouse. <laughs> how did you do that? She said, well, I went and took a taxidermy course. Oh, <laughs> really? Wow. And, and she was at pains <laughs> to emphasize that, that, that apparently there is something called ethical feminist taxidermy, which oh, I would never okay. have dreamed no. of, which is obviously no animals were killed. It was mm -hmm. all found creatures or ones mm -hmm. who died of natural causes. And it's also apparently there's, there's, a, there's a lot of female artists who are doing it as a kind of counterbalance to the, you know, Victorian museums stuff full of animals that, yes. that Victorian gentlemen went and shot yes. yeah. in Africa or Asia or whatever. So, hmm. um, but they are saying no. Actually, let's let's do this as a as a way of honouring. I think Shazia's phrase was honouring these brief lives. Oh. Which I thought was really just delightful. So she rolled up her sleeves and did the mouse taxidermy course. And it sounds excruciating. <laughs> but she came up with this just delicate, beautiful appreciation of the beauty of a little mouse. And um, there's a hummingbird in the um, in the poem sequence as well. So I would never have guessed, you know, that mm -hmm. a poet would be prepared to go that far for poetry. Right. I love that's that. In-depth research. That's fascinating. Yeah, <laughs> that's just fascinating. Method poetry. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> Well, I noticed on your website that you have something called um, Concrete Poetry, where you have collaborated with the stone sculpture and you guys put poetry on stone. Can you tell us about that? And oh, yes. That, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's beautiful, first of all. It's it's beautiful. Thank uh, you. The photo you have there is just gorgeous. But um, anyway, if you could tell us about that, that'd be awesome. Sure. So. Concrete poetry is the opposite end of the spectrum to what I'm doing on the podcast. Yeah, so yeah. on, I, I like to think of poems being kind of amphibious, that they can live on the <laughs> air or in the water. <laughs> so they, they could be in the ear when they're mm -hmm. spoken aloud or for the eye when they're on the page. Right. And there's an ongoing debate about which is the real poem. The answer <laughs> I like is the mystical answer, which is there is the true poem is beyond those two dimensions. It's uh, another yeah, dimension. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that these are just fragments of it, like, you know, reflected light. Um, anyway, so concrete poetry is, it's not made of, well, it can be made of concrete, but it's not necessarily. It's where the concrete expression of the poem, it could be about the print or the typography. So a lot of concrete poets do really weird things with print and mm -hmm. the shape of words on a page. Or it could be made of another material, it could be carved in wood or embroidered on a pillow 
and then the pillow is put in a room and then the whole room becomes the poem this is the oh, thing wow. mm, it's yeah. not like you put a poem on the pillow and then you put it in the room it's by the act of embroidering on that pillow for instance or carving um a poem on a fence out in the countryside that part of the countryside then becomes the poem wow, wow. and we took inspiration from a Scottish poet called Ian Hamilton Finlay, who's created a whole garden up near Edinburgh mm -hmm. with poems carved in stone and wood. Some even, they're carved in stone and then they're reflected on the water. So they're carved backwards. Mm. So you, have, you, can, you can only see it in the reflection. You can only read oh it in word. the reflection. So when you walk around Little Sparta, which is the name of his garden, you are walking around inside poetry. It's like the... So, the yeah, very interesting. Sheena Devitt is a wonderful sculptor and letter carver based in Northern Ireland. And she, she does a lot of stone carving and we got chatting, we decided to collaborate. So, mm -hmm. and, so, and again, so what we're not doing is I'm writing a poem and then she carves it. Right. We're coming to a piece and saying, this is what we're going to make. And we, we do a lot of, we've never actually met in person, come to think of it. <laughs> we do a lot of it on Zoom. We'll have a conversation. We'll share images. I might write some text. Sheena might make some sketches. It goes back and forth until we realize, oh, we've got something. Mm -hmm. And then Sheena actually does the hard work. She, she rolls her sleeves up and casts it in stone. <laughs> yeah. So our first piece is was for an exhibition around endangered species at the Lettering Arts Trust. And we decided to, to do moss, which was an easily overlooked form of endangered species, because mm -hmm. apparently moss is really crucial to all kinds of ecosystems. If the moss vanishes, then lots of the bigger creatures are going to be vanishing soon. Right. So that was what we came up with, and we called the piece Elegy for Moss. And we've got the word moss basically being spread over the stone, but the, the letters disappearing um, mm. the further down the stone you go and I can't really do justice to it because Sheena <laughs> carved it so beautifully and yeah, it's she carved gorgeous. all over the sandstone to make with a specially textured chisel so it looks like the texture of moss wow. so um, yeah so I mean you can probably find an image of it on her website SheenaDevitt.com okay that's we'll put page. that in the show notes yeah, yeah? okay yeah. that'd be great yeah. Yeah. Well, that's so interesting because it's it's like we were talking about poetry can be heard, it can be read, but it's almost like you're bringing it to a 3D type thing. Yeah, it's, you know, where it's it full, can. it's yeah. a, or yeah. immersive experience. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Well, because the the image that you have on your website, it's very tactile. Like like the the way that it's carved, it's got lots of ridges and stuff. I mean, yeah. I just found that, I mean, it was something I'd never seen. I thought it was really beautiful. I just, it, I looked at it. It for, is, and uh, you want to run your yeah. hands over it. And, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And also, the, another thing Sheena pointed out to me is when you carve words into a stone, you will, you, you're you also working with the light and shadow. So when the light mm -hmm. falls across it, it will highlight one side of the letter and put the other one in shade. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so you, she takes account of all of this mm -hmm. and she's been doing it for years and years. She's a real artist. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. I love that. I love that. So we'll put that, we'll put her. Yeah. We'll um, get that link. Yeah. Put it in the show. Link for right. sure. Yeah. Well, so one other question we wanted to ask you, we're, we're all about, you know, lessons learned and um, mm -hmm. what, what mistakes we've learned from. So what, what's the biggest mistake or mistakes that you see uh, poets making when they first start out? Years ago, I was on the editorial board of a magazine called Magma Poetry, uh, which is a wonderful magazine over here in the UK. And it, it was a nice thing because we all took turns to edit the issue. So that there would be a different editor every issue, mm -hmm. which meant that we could have lives and jobs. <laughs> and still have the thrill of, of working on a top-level poetry magazine. So when it was my turn to edit, it was uh, I got to I was, it was like going through the looking glass because you know I'd spent so long sending out poems and mostly seeing them being rejected, and a few acceptances here and there. Um, but this I was on the other side of the fence, so I was the person who was, and, and there was a real deluge of poems coming in the inbox, 
and via the post. Um, thousands, in fact. And it was really, one of the things I noticed, it was really, really obvious which poets had read a, a lot of poetry and which ones hadn't. Mm. Wow. And which ones particularly had read contemporary poetry and which ones had kind of stopped around the mid-19th century. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I would say whatever your, uh, whatever your genre, you, you need to be reading and you need to know all the, you know, the, the main authors in that. And I would say as much of the history of the genre as possible, you know, go back to where did it come from? Who started it and why? I think that's always a fascinating, you know, why, why did Gothic horror start as a, as a fictional genre, you know, mm. and what was driving that? Because very often when you go back, you know, whatever your genre is, you will find something maybe that, that, that could add a, a bit of pulse, a bit of inspiration, and certainly some depth and, and resonance to what you write. Right. So I would say if, if you want to be a serious writer of whatever it is, just read lots and lots of that and, and that's the the biggest thing I see at the beginning um you know certainly from the evidence of that inbox was people wanting to because you can't you know unless you've internalized that you don't know what possibilities are right 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 yeah we I mean we say that all the time on our podcast I'm sure you do, I'm sure you do. <laughs> read yeah. in your genre you really you're not going to know what's popular what's expected of you from the readers um unless you read in the genre but I love going back it made me think because I write romantic comedy and it made mm -hmm. me think that the first romantic comedy I read was by kind of the mother of all romantic comedies you know in in contemporary romance and her the reason she did it, it was it's a little bit of a rebellion and a little bit I mean you know it's a little she mm -hmm. intentionally made it a little edgier, but funny. And um, it just sort of sparked something for me when you said that. So that that's really smart. I, I hadn't thought about that. So that's really good. So what do you think the best thing you've done to set yourself up for success has been? Hmm. Uh, it's, a, it's probably an answer you've had loads of times, but actually putting writing first. Uh, in my day, yes. Um, yes. I used to, I used to have the existence where I was running around chasing my tail, trying to empty my inbox, trying to return my phone calls, trying mm -hmm. to, trying to keep up with all the stuff that was incoming, right? And that was for other people, and, and that was for tomorrow or this week. Yeah. And the thing that just get pushed off and pushed off and pushed off was was the actual writing, which is never really going to be for tomorrow mm -hmm. unless you're blogging. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But to, you know, to write anything significant, it's it's for the medium term, it's for the long term, it's, it's you know, your life's work. Mm -hmm. And I remember the day I decided, I had to look in the mirror and I thought, mate, you're going to have to get up early because mm -hmm. I didn't have, that was all the time I got. And I got up and started at half six. Right. And I would do an hour or two in the morning before I got on to all the other stuff. And, you know, these days I've, I've managed to push that forward so I get to spend the whole morning writing mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. I do my own you know business work in the afternoon um but that changed everything because from that point on I was creating my future mm -hmm. not not reacting to the present right right oh yes. gosh that's so good yes because <laughs> I feel yeah. that I feel like I'm reacting unless I get up and do it first thing mm -hmm. in the morning if and, not and, I'm chasing things mm -hmm. all day long and, and that feeling you know because Certainly, if you're a poet, you don't have to do 5,000 words a day. It could be a right. couple of lines. I'm, I'm walking on cloud nine if I think I've got two good lines this morning. <laughs> but just that feeling of if I've done my work today, yes. whatever I have to deal with later in the day, and we all have to do lots of things yes. for other people and mm -hmm. obligations, et cetera, it's, it's kind of okay. Mm -hmm. You know, I can yes. show up for other people. I can show up for my other responsibilities, my other life. Right. If I've, if I've, put a deposit in the you know my my account as a writer right but if I haven't oh it just feels like the yes. whole day has just been taken from me like you've done yes. a whole bunch of tasks that need to be done but not the one thing that need to be exactly. done it's yes. important exactly. yeah. yeah a load of yeah. fluff yeah mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Well, I think there's been so much good stuff in this interview. Yeah. So much 
um, just nuggets of wisdom. <laughs> so we appreciate you joining us and tell everyone where they can find out more about your podcast and about you. Well, thank you so much. I've, I've really enjoyed it. Um, so the podcast is called A Mouthful of Air, and it's on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all the usual places. There's also a website, a mouthful of air.fm, where you will get, remember the amphibious thing, you will get the text <laughs> of every poem. You also get a transcript, because some people would rather read. So you get transcript of every episode, whether yes. it's me talking or an interview. Um, you can get that delivered via email if you want to. Um, and the poems go on Instagram at Air Poets. Okay. So um, again, it, it turns out in the 21st century, people are reading poems on Instagram. So I thought, okay, yes. let's, let's go and join in. Yes. Um, yeah. You, I, just another way for people to find it. So that's yes, terrific. That's awesome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for being here. It's just, been, I've loved it. It's been great. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah. And we will have all those links in the show notes and they'll be at wish I'd known then podcast.com. And thanks to Alexa Larberg for editing and producing the podcast and to Adriel Wiggins for doing the admin and we'll see everybody next week. Bye. Thanks for listening to the wish I'd known then podcast. We hope this episode inspired you, empowered you and made you laugh a little bit too. If you loved it, tell your friends about it. And if you feel so inclined, leave us a review. We look forward to being with you again next week.